All right, we're going to look. We're going to look this morning at Acts chapter 15, and uh, what's considered the first church council. And uh, that church council uh, later, the church has met had met for many many different reasons, theological, most of them, uh, <clears throat> over the centuries. But this is the very first one, and it's in Jerusalem. And they have a specific problem that they want to solve, and it is the problem uh, of the gospel and what, what it's really about. And the question is, the gospel of grace or the gospel of law? So the question is, the gospel of grace or the gospel of law? And there were these, what we call Judaizers, who had attempted to get in, infiltrate uh, the, the Gentile believers and tell them that they really had to become Jews in order to be Christians. That yes, they had received the Spirit, and yes, they had prayed to accept Christ, but they needed to have added to that the law of Moses. And so these Judaizers tried to translate the gospel of grace into a gospel of law and grace, which really doesn't mix very well at all. And so uh, the, the, they, they, they made it sound like <clears throat> that the issue of being a Christian was not so much a relationship based on grace, but a relationship based on doing the right things. And that became a very important issue. And as you saw in the video, uh, the leadership in Jerusalem gets together. <clears throat> What's interesting is that there are levels going on in that leadership. The speakers, for instance, Paul and Barnabas came and they shared what was going on. Obviously the people had to know what was going on and they got to share and talk. And I can imagine all the stories that they were telling and, the, and how excited the Christians were there in Jerusalem and how exciting it must have been to hear the stories. But then the party of the Pharisees had to speak up and you saw that in the video. They had to say, well that's just fine, <clears throat> but they need to also understand that the law has to be satisfied. Now that really becomes part of the problem. Because either we satisfy the law ourselves, or Christ satisfies the law. And that's really the question. Can you satisfy the law? You notice that Peter, in his discussion, says, Why should we lay on them some burden that we could not meet? We couldn't bear ourselves. In other words, we could never have this personal relationship with Christ, or with God, through the law, it was a burden to us. But the point of the law was to be a burden so that they would know that they could be free from it through Christ. And so these Judaizers misunderstood and they said that what they need to be Jews. Later, then next, the apostles and the elders, they meet privately. It's interesting that the whole church meets together, they hear the stories, hear the accusations, and then the elders and the, uh, and the apostles in verse 6 get together and they talk. Now Peter then speaks. And I'm going to suggest to you that Peter gives a theological position. The theological position. And any time you make a decision, there are two levels for the decision. One is your, th one is your theology and one is your experience. You can't have one without the other. Theology without experience is dead. Experience without theology is heresy. And you have to have both. So anytime you hear someone say, well this has been my experience, your natural reaction has to be to go to the Word of God and say, let's balance it with the Word of God. And then if someone says, well this is my theology, you say, well that's alright, but what's the experience? Maybe you don't understand the theology yet. Maybe it's not consistent with your experience. Or why isn't your experience consistent with the theology? And so both of those are important. So Peter speaks and gives his theological position. Then Paul and Barnabas, Paul does not give his theological, his theological position. He tells them his experience. He gives the experiential position. Now I think that's important when you make decisions. What is the experience? What is the theological issue? What does the Bible say? What am I experiencing? If you say, well, the Bible says that we'll have this personal, wonderful relationship with Christ, and I don't have that, well, then you don't have the personal relationship. Then you don't have what it talks about. You say, well, you have no joy unspeakable. You have no excitement for the Word of God. You have no excitement to hear His Word preached. You have no excitement to sing worship songs to Him. You have none of that is a part of your life. Well, then your experience doesn't match theology. Then you don't have the theology. Those things need to be together. 
And when they're not together, something's wrong, one side or the other. And so they made their, 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 uh, their positions known. What's interesting, look at verse 13 in chapter 15. Now in verse 13. And verse 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Paul and Barnabas telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had uh, done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. And you say, well, what's the big deal about James? Well, James is the pastor. James decides somebody's got to make a decision. Somebody's got to make a decision. He goes through, and you saw in the video, how he makes the theological position. And he says, you know, Simon described how God, and he begins to talk about what Simon said. Then he quotes scripture in verse 16. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. He begins to say, here's the theological position. Here's the, here's the experience. And then verse 19 is important. James the pastor says, it is my judgment. Not our judgment. My judgment. Leadership always has to take responsibility to lead. And James takes responsibility. But now he doesn't take it lightly. He has sat through the entire meeting with all the church. He sat through Paul and Barnabas' discussion. He listens to their, their point of view. He listens to the Judaizers and their point of view. He listens to the theological discussion by Peter. He, he's listening to the Spirit of God. He is listening to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit is moving. You hear later, he, they say when they go to write their letter, he talks about how it seemed right to the Spirit and to us right to the spirit and to us so he's sensing the spirit he's listening to the arguments and he says now I've made a judgment and that word judgment means I've made a decision based on information and as a pastor he decides and he says it's my judgment therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God and you can imagine how Paul must have felt at that point can't you yes he's in the back going yeah yeah made it Right. He's got it right. They got it. They understand. What's interesting about Paul is that Paul had already gone back down to Jerusalem twice and talked to the disciples and talked to Peter explicitly about the gospel he was going to preach. And they had agreed with him. And he'd gone off. But for some people it's never enough. They want what they want. And the Pharisees demanded what they wanted and this, these Judaizers. Now the church is going to come out and they're going to make a statement and the pastor says, it's my decision, I've decided this. Then, with recognizing the leadership of the Holy Spirit, listening to the testimony, listening to the theology of it, he decides, the church then says, yes, we agree. And they're all of one accord, they all agree. Now it doesn't say what the Judaizers did, does it? It's always difficult <clears throat> when you're on the wrong side isn't it? When there's a decision made. It's always hard. It's always hard to submit or to admit. It's always hard to submit, as, as submit to authority when it means you're wrong. you have to say you're wrong. Nobody likes to say I'm wrong. It's interesting how kids will fight to say anything but I was wrong. And we do too. It's adults. Don't want to admit it. But those Judaizers had to say, uh-oh. They had to get in or get out. They had to get in or get out. What's interesting when they begin to disagree is that they, they did express themselves without authority. They went up and said some things. And the disciples, when they wrote their letter, said some went up and spoke to you without our authority. So they went up on their own without authority. And then they had to get pulled back in. Right? Get reeled back in. No, you're wrong. Come sit down. You need to be trained some more. Now they had to decide whether they were going to agree to that or not. In the church today, when there are disagreements, if you are wrong, and the church chooses that you are wrong, then you have a choice. Admit and get right or get out or the third which is stay in and gripe <laughs>
right? That so often is what people do. They never really submit, they just complain. Our kids do that. They don't really submit, they just gripe and complain and argue and talk back, all kinds of things, because they don't want to submit. And so here you have these people, they, I, I look at it and I, I want to believe, <clears throat> because I'm always uh, the most positive one around, I want to believe they just said, oh, sorry. We blew it. We were wrong. I guess it's for everybody. They don't have to become Jews. You know, the Gentiles don't have to. I can imagine them then saying, yeah, that's what I believe. It's not normal what they believe, you know. But what they ought to have done is, you know, what I would have said if I were a Jew there saying, if that's true for them, how about me? Can I quit all this other stuff and just trust Jesus? That's the, that's the direction I'd want. Well, the conclusion, they decided uh, they should not make it difficult. That's the word for you, difficult for the Gentiles. Why would you add something to the gospel? Why would you make it more difficult than it is? It's already hard to bow our knees to Jesus. It's already hard to submit to him. Why would you add something to that? Pride. Hmm? Pride. Pride. Yes, yeah, there is a form of control in that. When I add something, I now control something. And the church did that in the Middle Ages. It controlled everything. It controlled grace. It controlled um, forgiveness of sins. It controlled your future in heaven. It controlled everything. And it manipulated the people that way. And here, the disciples said, we're not going to do that. You want to abstain from pollu uh, uh, food polluted by idols and abstain from sexual immorality and from meat strangled and animals and blood. Then the church agrees, sends a letter out and tells the disciples uh, to go and to share this with the church. What's interesting to me is that this argument still goes on today. And it's the argument between legalism and grace. Whether we're going to live a life of legalism or a life of grace. Legalism is always the first choice away from grace. It is always the first choice away from grace. It is always the easy choice. It's easier to judge myself and others. That's just easier. If I set up a bunch of rules, your hair a certain length, your dress a certain length, your uh, clothes a certain thing, things you shouldn't have and shouldn't do, it's easier to judge myself and see how I'm doing. And easier to judge others. It's a substitute for relationships. You see, Christianity is about our relationships with God and with each other. That's why we're, we're a part of a family. You know, we're described as a body of Christ. We're described as the family of God. We're described by relationships, not by we all have the same color sweaters or we all have the same theological decisions we make. We are described as people in relationship to God. And what happens in legalism is, the second thing is it feeds the flesh. Self-righteousness. You see, if I have a list of things that I know I'm doing that makes me okay, then I feed that flesh and I can actually be proud. I'm better. I'm so good. And that's really what the Judaizers were doing. They were reducing Christianity down to a set of rules so that they could be self-righteous. You see, when you became a Christian, you had nothing you gave God. Nothing. What did you give him that he needed? You know, in, in, every, in every, every time we have something, a relationship, it is generally based on need. I need, she needs, he needs, we need, therefore we got together. And we're in a relationship. But when it comes to God, he needed nothing. He needed nothing. And if he needed nothing, what does he get out of this? Well, what he gets out of this is a relationship. He wants, but doesn't need. We, however, have the greatest need. And we don't even want it. He has the greatest want and no need. 